It's time! Hey, Dave, listen up, please. Scotty, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I got a question for you, though, Scotty. You know uh, that there's other players on our team besides Desi. But what are you waiting for? I don't know. Something amazing. Jones for three. And he banks it in. Bailey. Up and in and a chance for three. Welcome into the first episode of the year of the basketball podcast of Mid-America. I am Seth Campbell, joined as always by Scotty Bordelon. And I say as always because this is, what is this, the fourth year that you've done this? Third year that you've done the basketball podcast of Mid-America, Scotty? Yeah, I think. So I joined, joined Whole Hog in December 2017. I'm not sure that I did a podcast that for that season, but... I think me and Blake Sutton started the basketball podcast in Mid America. I think for the 2018-19 season. So I think this would be the third third year. So he's got plenty of insight. I'm grinning ear to ear that basketball season's here. Oh man, he really is too. I can see him six six feet apart, of course, but I can see him, and he is very excited that basketball season is starting. And I am too. I think that the NCAA, it took them, you know, basically a year. But they figured out a plan for the NCAA tournament as well, if that is what's going to happen. Uh, it's kind of fun. Everybody's going to be in Indianapolis, which is pretty unique, but I think is actually a really good plan to have everybody to limit travel, keep everybody there uh, all the way from the first four games, which I like to call the playing games of the tournament, to the championship, which was already scheduled in Indianapolis. Right. I think that that's a good idea from the NCAA, which – those are few and far between. I think there's a possibility that there's some pretty unique venues that some of those games could be played in. Like I, I think Matt and Orlander was throwing out just a bunch of the arenas and gyms in the Indianapolis area, and he mentioned a high school gym that, <laughs> I mean, it was one of the bigger high school gyms. You know, I think that could turn out to be a, a pretty pretty cool spot for you know some pretty meaningful games in, in March and April. See, that would be so much probably fun. Probably more March than April, but you get the point. Yeah, no, I think that that would probably, that would be so much fun. Uh, just, it's unique. Now, not fun because you're battling the virus and all of that stuff, but it's just a unique season, so you got to take it for what it is, right? The, it would be so cool to be a high school kid, like if you're in school then and you're not on spring break, to be able to go to those games. Just be like, hey, like, I'm, I'm piecing yeah, out just, history. Yeah, I'm dipping out on study hall. I'm going to, I'm going to watch whoever play that would be pretty cool but i don't know if that's gonna right i probably be able de- to happen. defeats the whole purpose of why they have them in indianapolis to mm-hmm. begin with but arkansas is gonna have four thousand fans in attendance which is tied for the largest crowd in the sec yeah that's gonna be big yeah for sure i think that's that's i mean it's clearly not going to be the same home court advantage for anybody right but i don't know we'll get into that i think arkansas is going to have some pretty good success at home Scotty does believe that's what we've got a loaded whole hog. Po- nope. Basketball podcast in mid America doing too many podcasts. Sorry. We've got a loaded basketball podcast in mid America for you. We're going to talk about the Razorback schedule, how we think it plays out their predictions and the media picked them to finish. Is it sixth? I believe in the sec. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we'll see if we agree or disagree with that. And then we've got some awards that we're going to hand out preseason awards and how we think that these awards are going to finish. Not where they are right now, but where we think they're going to finish. You know, you got your typical awards, your MVP, your most improved, your sixth man. But we also got some Arkansas-specific awards. So uh, we've got the Shooter, the Go-To, and Mr. Reliable. And we will explain all of those when we get there. But first, yeah, let's just dive in. It's been a long preseason because the season got cut short. And a Razorback team that was going to go to the postseason, whether or not it was the NIT or the NCAA, was yet to be determined by really what the Razorbacks did in Nashville. But... Instead, after losing the game against Vanderbilt, which kind of unique, Scotty, not a lot of teams in college basketball. Really, there's only like three or four. They get to finish their season with a win. Yeah, Arkansas is one of them. And Arkansas Arkansas was last year one of the teams that got to finish the season with a win. I think that team was just starting to play really well. 
Ah, like man. really well too. Ethan Henderson was coming on. Mason, jo- I'm more upset that the season got cut short because we got shorted at least one more, probably two more. Mason, maybe I don't know what Mason would have done. You know, he could have d- gone the Daniel Gafford route and just entered the draft before the postseason. Right. To, if they made the NIT for sure. Yeah, but I was really upset that you know Mason Jones' season got cut short and hate it for a guy like. Adrio Bailey too. Yeah. He was he was a ton of fun to cover. And then Jimmy Witt and I mean you can go on and on and on. Just hate that it got cut short, but I'm I'm pumped about this team. I'm excited to, you know, track roles, see how roles change throughout the season and you know, figure out I mean, we haven't seen I'm I'm super excited to like do shot charts for each of these guys and figure out like where on the floor they're best at. And track usage rates and and that kind of stuff. We just have no idea. Yeah, we just we really don't. I don't know if the red white game. I don't know what you can take from that. Other than I think JD Note is going to take a lot of shots. <laughs> Musselman took the fact that he was really upset with the white team's defense. Yeah, that's something else. I'm not not exactly sure if this defense this 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 team is going to play defense the way that the last years did. Right. I think that's. Let's go ahead and let's just dive into that. I think that that is a unique perspective that that team brought is that I think last year's team, I don't know what Musselman said or his staff said, uh, but to get their mentality was we are not going to be the most talented, the most athletic team when we step out on the court on most Sunday Sundays, on most days in the SEC, but we're going to outwork you. And Musselman's team – when they the way they flew to defend three point shots, which they were the best three point defensive team in the country, the way that the guys were undersized but could box out, and yeah, there were some disasters of games on the rebounding front. When you're talking about LSU, both times, uh, those are games that come straight to my mind. But at the same time, these guys fought hard, were undersized, and you've got what four or five players that are taller than the tallest player on the team last year. Yeah, so. The the difference is going to be astronomical. Don't expect this team to be last year's team in that regard. I think that on the plus side, I think that they're going to be able to score a lot more, and there's going to be a lot of people, more people that can score. It's not going to be Mason balance. Jones, Jimmy Witt, and Isaiah Joe, and then you know you may get a few points from and like not to dig, like play down the fact of Desi Sills was a key part of that team as well and Adriel Bailey, but. The scoring on this team, I think, is going to be balanced. And it's going to be one of those situations of, you know, you're going to have a go-to guy or two or three guys that you're really going to depend on. But that doesn't mean that a guy coming off of the bench, a Devo Buckets, a, you know, Jalen Williams can't go for 15 in a game uh, if they're not going to guard him. So I think that that offensively, this team is a lot better than last year's team just because of how many weapons they have which is kind of hard to say because Mason Jones was just so good offensively yeah. last year. But defensively, they might struggle a little. Yeah, I think what we're going to see offensively from Arkansas is you you might have two guys who were pretty consistent scorers, but I think like the three, four, five, and maybe even six, they could alternate game by game. And we'll get into – I guess we can get into that a little bit later. But defensively, is that's my biggest concern. Going into the seasons, like you mentioned, Arkansas was the best team in the country defending the three last year. And Eric Musselman has talked in the preseason that, you know, he's he's a little bit concerned with the way Arkansas defends the perimeter. And, you know, they've I saw watching the red white game on uh last week, you know, they were doing the brick drills mm-hmm. where, you know, they're closing out on shooters with bricks in each of their hands. And, you know, when you take those bricks out of their hands, it's a little bit a little bit easier to put those hands up. I think that's that's going to be a big deal. As Arkansas was so good at, like, clouding the line of vision on shooters to the rim last year, and they had consistent high hands. And, you know, I think one of the things – you know, Arkansas was a lot bigger this year, but I think one of the reasons that Arkansas was so good defending the, the three last season was they were a little bit smaller – more athletic, quicker to get out to the perimeter. How does a bigger, how does a bigger team defend the perimeter? You got added length, but maybe they don't get out to the perimeter as quick. I think the economist Thomas Sowell said there are no solutions, only trade-offs. 
your trade-off for this team on defense may be the fact of they're going to rebound better, but they can't defend the three as well. It could be a team that protects the rim better. And that's not Which Arkansas thing. was good protecting the rim last year, too, right. with you know a pretty short team, Adrian Bailey. I mean, we can't discount. I mean, he was a monster defending the rim at times last year. So who who steps in? I think Justin Smith could be that guy. Connor Vanover is obviously – he's going to block some shots on accident just being as tall and long as he is. Um, don't know if Vance Jackson is going to give you much in that regard, but Jalen Williams might. Um, yeah, I think there's just – there's lots of possibilities. But You also have to have somebody take over the spot that Jimmy Witt did as a rebounder from like the top three positions, from the one, mm-hmm. two, and three. Because re- Witt was – fantastic at that. And that's one of the reasons why Musselman brought him in is because he knew that he was going to have a smaller team and needed somebody that could rebound. That was Jimmy Witt. Now with a larger team, the one, two, and three spots may not be required to guard as much, but we'll see that. Something I thought that was interesting from the red-white game is something that Arkansas never did last year was they brought some pressure. It was pretty much token pressure from a zone in full court, but they did bring some full court pressure in the red-white game, showed that they have that in their repertoire which it made sense why Arkansas didn't do it last year. They had seven to eight guys that reliably could play. But with a deeper bench, maybe Musselman extends it a little bit. But let's be real. The bread and butter of this team on defense is just going to be the man-to-man. That's what Musselman has played and will play from here until he stops coaching. Yeah, I agree, I agree with you there. Uh, who, who would you say is, who would you say is your, your favorite to lead the team in rebounding from the guard spot? I think that's that's a big deal. That's another, like you mentioned, Jimmy Witt was really good defensively, you know, matched up on the opposing team's best guard. Like we saw that last year several times with like a Santiago Vescovi at Tennessee and um, Kyra Lewis at, at, at Alabama. I think it, it right now I'm kind of leading toward Moses Moody, and I think Jalen Tate could be a, a sleeper. You took the two right out of my mouth. I think that Moody is going to be on the floor and log the, one of the most minutes, if not the most minutes for this team. I think that Musselman kind of showed that if you watch the post-game press conference from the red-white game or maybe the conference press conference before the red-white game, I can't remember which, but he was talking about how they ran a bunch of plays to figure out who would be um, some of the guys that they could depend on in ending game situations before the season in he mentioned Moses Moody as the top guy there. So I think that that's something to watch out for, and I don't want to give away our go-to there, so I'm going to stop before we get to that. But I think the, the, the fact that Moses Moody will be on the floor the most gives him the opportunity to get the most rebounds, but also Jalen Tate using his experience. He's a graduate senior, grad transfer senior. He's really long, too. He's Yeah, he's I, I want to say lanky in a way to get into there. So I think that both of those guys will be able to replace it. And then offensively, I mean, we talked about it, Scotty. This this team's got firepower. J.D. Note, holy smokes. He didn't shoot the ball very well, switched teams. Um, Maybe they just need to give him, like, to switch jerseys at halftime if he's not shooting well or something. And then shot lights out. It's one of those situations of, like just give that ball to man, and as soon as he crosses half court, let him fire it up because it could possibly go in. JD's going to be really good. Like I've been saying that, I guess, kind of since since this time last year. Probably, probably. And then you know, talked to Eric Musselman and Corey Williams about him back in March or April, and they just they like they saw a lot of added confidence with him throughout his his red shirt year, and worked on his perimeter shot a lot. He also worked on, you know, shooting off the dribble. We saw plenty of that in the the red-white game. I don't know that I was expecting him to shoot as much as he did. Right. But it tells you right there that the dude is confident as can be. And I think he's going to be a guy that that scores kind of at at all three levels. He can – I think he's clearly quick enough to get to the rim. How well he finishes I think is – going to be something to to keep an eye on he also said that he in addition to you know getting a shot off off the dribble just working to get defenders on his hip and then shooting from shooting in those scenarios 
where maybe he's he's got a guy you know right behind him, but he can still elevate and get it shot off. That could be a weapon in the mid range, um, and then perimeter wise, like he's I think I mean he's going to be really solid. He might not shoot a, a great percentage. That's something that Eric Musselman talked about. I think before the red white game, they want to see his his three point percentage kind of kind of rise up, and and, and sh- he wants Note to shoot the three the way he did his freshman year at, at Jacksonville. I think he was he was pretty solid there. He's going to be he's going to be dynamite. I think I, I'm predicting that he's going to be you know top three in scoring, and he might be he might be top two in the SEC or in on the, on on, on this Arkansas team. I think yes. I, I don't have any more to say about that because you hit the nail right on the head. J.D. Note is going to be a scorer. I think that we have gone too far in this podcast, Scotty, without mentioning the man that is returning in Desi Sills. I think that Musselman was upset that he missed a few shots. He said that most of the time those will fall, talking about the red-white game. And so I think that he's going to be a guy that this team can depend upon. And I think that he's going to be a steady eddy force through everything. Whereas you know Moses Moody might play the most minutes, and you know Justin Smith might have um, a go-to game or two, and then JD Note can be the shooter. I think the guy that's when push comes to shove down the stretch, and maybe not necessarily you might not need a bucket, but you need somebody to bring the ball up or just have that calming presence. I think that's going to be Desi Sills. Yeah, I think he's a candidate for your Mister Reliable. Maybe. Um, he's not, he's not my Mr. Reliable. Um, but I think Desi's, Desi worked so much, so hard in the offseason. Like if you follow him on Instagram, you saw a bunch of the workouts and stuff that he did. He's coming into this season with the major chip on his shoulder. Now that's very cliche and it kind of hurt to say that, <laughs> but he, like, I think he understands that there's a lot more offensive weapons on this team than last year. And so he's like, if I'm going to get mine, like I've got to put the work in to improve in a number of different areas. I don't think that we're going to see Desi come out and from three-point range just fall into a slump like he did last year. I think you're probably going to see a more steady Desi and going to shoot the three pretty well. And he's still going to – he might even be more – aggressive and fearless than he was last year we've got vegas vance i think steady desi is our not our next nickname yeah i like it Ste- yeah steady I, could, I could get with that my prediction for desi is that he's going to lead arkansas in transition scoring he was arkansas according to hoopland's analytics they track this stat called points above median which is additional points a player scores compared to like the average player with the same number of attempts, he was like, I think his points above median in transition last year was 20. And that was second on the team only to Mason Jones. And so Desi was really good in transition last year. I don't have any doubt that he's going to be that again. And I think he's going to be a little bit more of a consistent three point shooter. He's going to have, he's going to have a big year and he's going to have to play a lot of minutes. Yeah. Talked about in transition with Mason Jones. That's another thing that they're going to have to miss is this somebody that can get to the line. Who's going to be the guy that can, get to the line as well as Mason Jones did, or, you know, that's a lot of pressure to say as well as Mason Jones did, but can get to the line. He was best in the country. He drew like eight fouls a game last year. He can get to the line when Arkansas needs somebody to drive to the hole, make a basket or get fouled. Uh, That's, that's another question mark. All right, Scotty, we've teased it enough. Let's get into the schedule. Let's talk about Arkansas's upcoming schedule. They got a game Wednesday to start this season against Mississippi Valley state. I don't want to pull punches here. One of, if not the worst team in the NCAA. They are dead last in the Ken Palm rankings, 357 out of 357. So if that tells you anything, um, you know, don't get too excited if Arkansas wins this game by 50, and don't get too excited if Arkansas only wins it by, you know, 2010 because Arkansas is trying to work some kinks out as well uh, in the first game. And maybe Coach Musselman knows that this is not just a great Mississippi Valley State team that they're playing and wants to get some guys some playing time. I think obviously Muss is going to floor his best guys in that first in that that first game, but once the game is in hand, that's when he's probably going to start tinkering. So I'll be curious to see who his, you know maybe his top 6 or 7, maybe 8 guys are and then just kind of watch once the game is kind of out of hand, which it probably will be. Ken Palm's given Arkansas a 99.97% chance to win that game. Who are who are some of like the two or three player combinations that you really like? You know, outside of the top five, 
I think that could that could be something interesting to watch that could, you know, come to the forefront in, in later games. Yeah. As you're getting ready for the next morning, you know, you're off work and you're gonna have your day off. Just sit down, turn on the TV, watch you some Arkansas Razorback basketball for the first time this year, and then wake up the next morning and eat you some turkey. And then get ready because then the season is off and running. Yeah. They play again on Saturday against North Texas, which North Texas has had good teams off and on uh, throughout the lat past decade. That's a team to watch. And then Arkansas's next game against UT Arlington is another game to watch. All right, Scotty, they have nine non-conference games, eight before SEC play in the Big 12 SEC Challenge. In the nine non-cons, what do you got them going? I've got Arkansas going eight and one in non-conference, and I think they'll probably go into conference play 8-0. And, and I, that Oklahoma State game, that's tough. Like going to Gallagher Ive is really tough. And Oklahoma State, on top of having Cade Cunningham, who I think was the – I think he was – might be the only freshman who was named an AP preseason All-American. I mean, he's he's a major pro- – He's he a, the he's number one overall recruit, major right? Major problem. Yeah, he's going to be really good. On top of that, I think Oklahoma State's got an All Big Twelve guard too. So it's not just Cade Cunningham. That's going to be that's going to be a tough game. And that's you know that's that Oklahoma State game. Arkansas plays nine SEC games and then Oklahoma State and then nine more SEC games. So sandwiched right in there. That's a tough that's a tough road game right in the middle of conference play. I'm interested to see what Oklahoma State's motivation is by that point. What has happened? What's going on? Because Cade Cunningham and the Oklahoma State Cowboys are not eligible for the postseason this year because of – was it recruiting infractions? I believe so. I think so. I'm not I'm super not well versed on, on I'm not, Oklahoma uh, State's issues. Yeah, I'm not either. Arkansas has got enough that we try and keep up with, so don't quote me on that. But they're, they're, I do know that Oklahoma State cannot make the NCAA tournament uh, or any postseason play this year. But still, instead of just – taking the year off and declaring to go pro Cunningham decided to stay with Oklahoma state. And so it'll be interesting to see what their motivation is like. You know, maybe this is a situation, uh, last year, like with Memphis, um, why am I blanking on that guy's name? The recruit that was at Memphis. Oh, I feel so dumb. Not, uh, James Wiseman. Oh uh, yes. Thank you, Scotty. The fact that Wiseman played four games, five games, and then was out for Memphis you know, I don't know necessarily think that that is what's happening or Cunningham wouldn't have stuck around because he knows what's coming at Oklahoma State. But you never know. There could be a situation where Wiseman isn't there. Uh, Cunningham isn't there anymore. So that's just something to keep an eye out on. I have Arkansas going 8-0 and to start the season off and then finishing 8-1 and as well. Uh, it's not very good podcasting when you agree with your co-host over here. But I don't see right now from where we are sitting on in November – getting towards late November. I don't see how Arkansas goes to Oklahoma State and wins that game. They do have the fact of they are not going to have to play in front of a full Gallagher-Iba arena, which will help, but still. Not to get too off into the weeds here, but I'm looking at Oklahoma State's schedule before they play Arkansas. Yeah. They're three games before they play Arkansas at West Virginia, who's number eight on Ken Palm. They're at home against Baylor, number one on Ken Palm, and then they go to Iowa State. Those are three really tough games before before you play Arkansas. They've got five days off before they play Arkansas uh, between that Iowa State and Arkansas game, but that's that's that could be a that could be a really tough stretch for a for a team. You know, once you get into, I mean, you're getting late into the the month of January. I know Arkansas was supposed to play Oklahoma this year in Tulsa, but I think I'm a little tired of the Oklahoma State matchup in the Big Twelve SEC Challenge. You got to be excited that you're making the Big 12 SEC Challenge because I believe what is it next year that they won't be in it if it keeps going according to um, because Arkansas finished outside of the top nine, ten. Arkansas finished outside of the top ten last year, but don't quote me on that either. Uh, this is good podcasting radio, radio. <laughs> uh, but you got to be excited that you're in the Big 12 Challenge, but at the same time. I'm a little worn out of the Oklahoma State matchup. Can we not play Texas? Give us an Iowa State game. Give us Nebraska. Oh, Nebraska's terrible. And Nebraska's in the Big Ten. That was not the Big 12. Wow. I would have liked Baylor. Yeah. Baylor's going to be a lot. Baylor was a possibility. Yeah. 
Baylor's going to be a lot right now. You know, they were the number one team in the nation or up there. I can't remember because I think they did lose yeah, to Kansas. preseason number one on Ken Palm. I so, mean, they're projected to be really good. And then, you know, I think the this, season, this Arkansas-Oklahoma State game just has a little bit more meaning than in the past just because it's, what, scheduled eight months after Eddie Sutton passed. Right. You know, he coached at both schools, led both schools to Final Fours. You're you're exactly right. That that does have some extra meaning. I think it's going to be interesting. Last time Arkansas visited there, they got blown out by Oklahoma State in a game that they really weren't supposed to. It's supposed to be a close game. Uh, I believe that was Jalen Barford and Dusty Hannes. Dusty Hannes yep. that year. Okay. Yeah, I remember watching that game at home back in South Arkansas. Arkansas was never in that game. Never. All right. So moving on to SEC play now, Scotty. So you have them going eight and one in the SEC. Or pardon me, in the non-conference, ain't no going into SEC play. How do you fe- feel like they pan out in SEC play? It's interesting because I, I think Arkansas is going to hold serve at home. Like I don't, I just I don't see, as of right now, Arkansas losing a, a an SEC game at home, which gives them nine wins, right out of eighteen. And then I think there are some winnable road games. Like you go to Vanderbilt, that's kind of a gift like anytime Vanderbilt is on your schedule home or away I think that's a gift and And there is a slight potential there for a former Arkansas kid to once again try and wreak havoc yeah that's very true all I can think about is Kevon Allen in Florida but that's a there's a little different scenario yeah Isaac McBride could could haunt Arkansas a little bit in that game but I think Arkansas probably wins that one and then Arkansas gets Missouri in a home and home I think Arkansas beats Missouri in Bud Walton and I think they beat Missouri in Columbia um, so I would probably, I'd probably say eleven. What would that make? Our with eleven and seven. 11, I'll go with that. Eleven and seven. And where do you think they finish in the SEC? Eleven wins. Eleven wins would probably put them fifth or sixth, maybe. <coughs> Somewhere in the four to six range. I think that eleven this year might get you. I'd say four to five. Yeah. You know, Probably leaning more toward four or five than six, than but yeah. Six. But you just you don't necessarily know how the rest of the season is going to play out. But yeah, I think that would be a really good season for Arkansas. I think that that's something that you can hang your hat on. You're definitely an NCAA team. I think that this is an NCAA team with my projection as well, although it's a little different than Scotty's. You, if you're eleven and seven in conference, that gives you eight losses on the year. You're probably pushing that five six seed in the NCAA tournament. And this is going to be a little different because you're not going to play as many games. So if you only had five six losses in a regular season, you're close up there to 19, three, four. 19 and eight Arkansas team in the regular season. You go into the SEC tournament, win another game. Say you go one and one yeah. in the in the SEC tournament, that puts you at 20, yeah. 20 and nine. That's pretty solid. Yeah, yeah. I think that you're you're definitely played yourself out of that eight nine. Match up with a one later. I think that you're probably sitting around fifth, sixth, seventh. Yeah, I could see probably a, a six or a seven, probably more toward a seven. Okay. And it also depends on where how the rest of the league finishes out. If you right. are fourth in the league, that plays a little bit better than you being sixth in the league. I have Arkansas at, as I said, eight and oh going into the season, eight and one in non conference, uh, going in, and then I have them at nine and nine. I think that. They do steal a few games on the road. Like you said, at Vanderbilt, at Missouri, I do believe are two games that they can steal on the road. But if you go through their home schedule, so this is what I did. I went through their home schedule. Missouri, I think that's a win. Georgia, I think that's a win. Uh, Then you play Auburn. I have a star beside that game. Mississippi, Mississippi State, both wins. A&M, I think, is a win. And then I have a star beside Florida, Bama, LSU. I think out of those four games, Arkansas wins two of them. And then... They lose two of them. Alabama's projected to be above Arkansas, and I know that that's a tough pill to swallow sometimes for Razorback fans, but they've got a really good recruiting class uh, that they brought in. Um, Nate Oates, former Buffalo, right? Mm-hmm. Coach is there at Alabama now. So I think that I think he's a good coach. LSU is just always a competitive game, regardless of where you're playing them at and how good they are, but they are good, again, maybe because they – Brought in the bag man, but whatever. <laughs> um, and then Auburn and Florida are both decent teams as well. I, Florida's been that team that's just kind of hung around it towards the top of the conference, but with their coach hasn't uh, with Mike White, they really haven't taken the step as being the top team in the SEC. Yeah, I think that's a 
that's a game that I would definitely put a star by that Florida game. It's a, it's on a Tuesday at home, and you know depending on the tip time, could determine you know if Arkansas gets four thousand in there or fifteen hundred to two thousand, and it's a, the crowd's even less of an has even less of an, an effect on Florida. Florida's got the preseason player of the year on their team, Keontae Johnson. And then Scotty Lewis, I think, is he's on he's on a watch list for I think he's one of the top twenty shooting guards in the country. So Florida's Florida's gonna be really good. I think that that home game is that home game's a big one. I mean, if you're looking for a potential boost in your resume, you know, Florida's top twenty five on Ken Palm. I mean, you have you gotta you gotta hold court, you know, hold serve at home and and win games like that, you know, if you want to get the the preferred NCAA tournament seating potentially, those those games are big. I'm just kind of sad, Scotty, looking at this schedule and this Arkansas team and the fact of just what we saw from the Arkansas fan base last year, the Kentucky game, the loudest environment I've ever been in in my entire life. Mm-hmm. You build off of that with other games that Arkansas was loud and Arkansas fans were proud and it's kind of disheartening. I am really excited, don't get me wrong, that we're going to get college basketball this year. Just the fact that we get it is going to be amazing. It's just kind of di- sad because I was there for the red-white game. Uh, I got to cover it in person, and there were fans. They, there were over 2,000 people there, um, fans extending into the upper deck. It's just not the same. Like You're socially distant. You, 4,000 versus 20,000, which Arkansas, I think, is officially capped at like 18.5, so close to 19. There's a difference. I'm sorry. And it just kind of stinks, the fact of the environment's not going to be the same. But all of that, my negative Nelly side, put that away, is going to be a good season for Arkansas. Um, Just looking through the schedule, it kind of got me sad when I'm thinking these games against Florida, against LSU, against Auburn that, you know, LSU's on a Saturday. In fact, the, towards the end of the season, the Razorback Nation would pack that butt out for that game. But instead, uh, it's going to be eerily quiet compared to what it would be. All right. If my projections are right, so I have them going nine wins, nine losses in conference play, which would put them overall at 17 and 10. I still believe that's an, S- an NCAA tournament team, but I bet you're looking at an 8-9 seed at 17 and 10 which Arkansas just loves those eight Yeah, then you'd have to go do some work in the tournament. Yeah. All right. Or, sorry, I mean, I'm talking about 8-19 in the NCAA tournament. Yeah. And in the SEC, you're probably finishing six. Yeah, you might have to win a game or two in the tournament to improve your seed line. Yeah. All right. Well, Scotty, that is a wrap-up of how we see the season going. Let's get into some individual awards before we wrap it up here on the Basketball Podcast of Mid-America. We thank you for joining us here on the Basketball Podcast of Mid-America. All right. We'll start from the top and go down. Who's your MVP of this team? My MVP is going to be JD Note. I think he's I think he's going to be like I said earlier, he's going to be awesome. There are probably going to be some stretches where he plays somewhat inefficiently, but I think he's going to be a guy that like Eric Musselman said is streaky and he's going to score in bunches and I think his scoring ability alone might win Arkansas a couple of games. I'm going to go with with JD. And I think not only he's is he going to be one of Arkansas's top scorers. I think I don't know that you could glean this from the red white game, but I think he's going to be better a better facilitator than what he showed in that inter squad scrimmage. I think he's going to be a pretty well rounded guy. Definitely a score score first type guy. But you know if he moves to that. You know, if he moves to the, the 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 two, maybe even the three, sometimes I think you could I think you could probably expect some big scoring nights from him. But if he's got the ball in his hands a lot, like he did in the red white game, it probably it probably mix it up a little bit. I think he get some some teammates involved in and scored a pretty good clip. That's a good pick. He's gonna he's gonna be the guy. I think that's gonna be the face when. I think about this. I think of, all right, so you're going on a TV broadcast, right? A bunch of us watch the games on TV, and a lot more of us are going to watch the games on TV this year. When you open a TV broadcast, the announcers normally choose two guys from each team to talk about, right? The two guys that could be an impact on each team. Who is going to be the guy that Arkansas leans in and out and is going to be in that mentioned 
basically every single game. You know, it was Mason Jones last year and Isaiah Joe more than likely. Sometimes Jimmy Witt got brought up into that. J.D. Note is going to be a guy that's up there at the top, mentioned in that list a lot of the time. Uh, so I think that's a really good pick. I am going to go with Justin Smith. It was a toss-up between Justin Smith and Moses Moody. I'm really high on Moses Moody, but I think a lot of people are. I don't think that's news to anybody. Moses Moody is a very good athlete. Uh, I think that Justin Smith is going to be the MVP. Just going through, look at, listening some, or listing some of these stats. He's got the experience in a Power 5 conference. This is his fourth year. He played in all 98 games when he was with Indiana, all the way from his freshman year. He started in 73 of those. He led the team in steals and minutes last year. And he has just played big-time college basketball. He's a bigger body inside that Arkansas can utilize. And he's going to be the guy that is going to get those inside points. He may only average, I think he averaged 10 points last year, mm -hmm. 10 points yeah, a game. Yeah, 10 and 5 last year. I think that his defense inside is going to keep him on the court because he let, as I say, let Indiana in minutes played. I think his defense is going to keep him on the court for a lot of potential for him to play. He's going to bang it around inside a little bit. He's going to keep some bigger guys in check. You know, with him, you know, it just depends on the lineup. But if Connor Vanover's in there with him, then he's going to get to guard a four and he might be a, a, maybe a little bit quicker than a four. And then he worked on his outside shot all year long. Yeah, he did. He looked good in the red-white game, too. He went three for three, and if he keeps that up, I'm not expecting him to be perfect, but if he can shoot it a little bit better than Adriel Bailey last year from outside. You know, Adriel Bailey, Musselman said in the post-game. He post -game, was a surprise perimeter threat last year, yeah. If he's open, shoot it, is what they were telling Adriel Bailey. You know, if you can make that think about guarding you from the outside, then that's a win. I even see Justin Smith going one step farther to where not if you're just wide open, but if they're going to play off of you a few steps to being able to pull that up and shoot. If you can shoot 30 to 35% from three, because I'm expecting him to be able to shoot just wide open jumpers as well. That's why I say that 30 to 35%, then you're going to have make people respect you in the outside. And I think that's just going to open up the lane for a lot of other people as well. That's why I'm going with Justin Smith as my MVP uh, I would not be surprised if J.D. Note was there. I would not be surprised if Moses, Moses Moody was there. In all honesty, I would not be surprised if Desi Sills finds his way into that conversation. But preseason after... Yeah, we didn't have a heart and soul of the team award that would go to Desi. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I think that it's going to be Justin Smith. And don't worry, Scotty will find a way to write and talk about Desi I just Sills. did. I just did. I just created an award for, <laughs> for my guy. <laughs> well, I mean, he's in the intro uh, to the podcast, so you, you kind of have to. All right, most improved is what we're moving to now. Who do you think is going to be the most improved on the Razorback team? This might surprise some people. I think it's going to be Connor Vanover. He's missed some time in the preseason, and I think when during the summer when Arkansas's roster got released, they had him listed at 7'3", 247 pounds, which that's – A unit. Yeah, that's a unit for sure. Um, he has battled an illness – Kind of, I guess, kind of a stomach bug, and not COVID. Yeah, not COVID related. What they're what they're saying, but he's lost quite a bit of that weight that he put on, you know, in his development year and prior to preseason practices getting going. And I think in the red white game we saw a little bit of the rust. I mean, I think he was he was one of five from three. Yeah, one of five from three. I think it might take a game or two, maybe three, for him to to get into a groove, get back to feeling, you know, maybe 100%, you know, get some actual game minutes underneath him because he hasn't played in an actual game in a long time. He's been well over a calendar year, but he's going, he's going to figure it out. And he is – I think he's in line for, you know – I think he's in line for a, a pretty healthy number of three-point attempts, you know, as the trail big in Arkansas's transition. And he's going to be – he's going to find himself wide open a lot, probably just in the, in the half court, just with with solid ball movement. I think you're going to find that, that he's going to have plenty of three-point attempts that are just – nobody's blocking a shot anyway. Right. But you give Connor Vanover a clean look at the rim, he's going to shoot a pretty good clip. So I think he's he's going to have a pretty big year. But he'll he'll get better as the season moves on. I have Vanover for another award, which I will get to in a second. But 
I think that you're exactly right, Scotty. His ability to trail. I don't know how familiar you are with Mike Neighbors in the Arkansas women's basketball team, but they call that trail big. Uh, they call it a dragon, and it's supposed to lag behind. I wrote a really cool story. At least I thought it was really cool. Uh, I hope that other people do too uh, about Chelsea Dungey and her senior year upcoming. It's going to run in Hogs Illustrated soon, hopefully. Um, but Schaefer, Todd Schaefer, the women's coach, told about talked about when Dungey is in the game in the position that she runs, she is not supposed to hustle down the court. She is supposed to be the trail big in the fact of that the defense can almost forget about her and she can shoot it up. It's almost the same thing with Connor Vanover. In the fact of Connor, listen, we know that Connor is not going to be the fastest guy on the field, on the field, on the court. We know that for a fact. But his ability in trail positions to where if you can get dribble penetration and people have to worry about the guard coming down, and then all of a sudden you can get a kick out to Connor. Even a covered Connor is like a, almost an open Connor because he's seven foot three. So the fact that he is going to be able to shoot those shots is going to be really good. And that's why I have him as another position. My most improved is going to be Jalen Williams. I thought that Musselman said after the post game press conferences in the red white game that. You know, he was not impressed at all with how Jalen Williams performed for the white team. Uh, he had some turnovers, made some mistakes, but I think that that was him getting ahead of himself. He said the way that Williams practiced in practice uh, really showed the fact of that he believes that Williams can be a key part. And I think there's just one of the situations of it might take a few games for the game to slow down for Williams at the college level. But I think that he will be a key piece coming off the bench for Arkansas to spell a guy maybe like a Justin Smith or a Connor Vanover. Get in there. Uh, I'm very big man centric here early. Uh, it's but, all good. But uh, I think that Arkansas Jaylen, finally got some now. I, I if we, they got him, I got to talk about him because they might leave. Uh, but I think that Jalen Williams will be the most improved. He's he's got potential. Yeah, of course, like, all those freshmen have potential. I like Jalen a lot, and I talked to Fort Smith Northside's boys basketball coach Eric Burnett back during the summer about Jalen and Jalen was the Arkansas Gatorade player of the year his senior year of high school and just I mean dominant like big time double doubles averaged several assists several blocks a game and Eric Burnett said he can do a lot more at Arkansas than he did in high school now that's probably going to take some time like the learning curve for freshman big men is probably greater I think, than the guard spot. It's because, I mean, in high school, Jalen's not accustomed to playing guys his size or bigger, and that's going to take some getting used to. But he brings some things to the table that are really intriguing to me. Like Moses Moody brought up the fact that he sets really good picks. Like that's that's invaluable. You know, if you're running a, a motion offense, if you're – I mean, it, Musselman could put Jalen on the floor just – to set screens in a and like if you need a bucket late in the game, Jalen could set you a pretty good screen. I'm gonna track his screen assist. Do you know what a screen assist is? No. It's like when you're setting a, a ball screen that immediately leads to a score. I think Jalen could probably I'm gonna try to track that. I think he could he could lead the team in that. Um, you know, if, if Arkansas puts him in in, you know, pick and roll situations. Really good passer. I think he's got a probably underrated vision for for a six ten guy, and pro- he might be Arkansas's best passing big since Trey Thompson. Trey Thompson was really good; he was had good really passer. good vision as a big guy. Um, and he can step out and shoot it too. And he can bring the ball to the floor like that's that's a wonderful skill set to have. And he could still grow, according to Eric Burnett, to be seven foot one. He could be he could be scary by the end of his Arkansas career. All right, Scotty, moving on. Good insight there. Moving on to the sixth man of the year. This is a hard award for us to do preseason because we don't know necessarily what the lineups will look like, but this is a guy that we think will more than likely come off of the bench and make an impact. And if he ends up starting, uh, I won't hold it against us in the fact of when we come back and look at these things towards the end of the year. What do you think, sixth man? I've got two guys that are kind of on my mind right now. They're, it's it's Jalen Tate and K.K. Robinson. And I think Jalen Williams would probably be my third my third pick there. I think Jalen Tate, I don't know if he's going to be in a starting role right away. You know, if if I was if I was in charge of setting the starting lineup for game one, I would probably have Jalen Tate coming off the bench. So I went with Jalen. 
I think he's going to be I think he's going to be a pretty solid facilitator, but he finished with a handful of assists in the red white game too. Looked pretty good there. And then obviously he's really good defensively. And KK Robinson, I think, has got a chance to be to to push for a lot more playing time. Maybe that sixth man role, maybe even start a few games. Uh, if some of the guards slip a little bit, he's just he's such an efficient player. Um, he was he knocked down four jumpers in in the red white game. Finished a couple times at the rim. I think he had a dunk too. Um, really good defender too. Like he's a guy that you could put in the backcourt with a little bit of token pressure, give give opposing ball handlers some fits. So I think KK's probably. He might be in line to play the the second most. Could he? I think potentially. I think Jalen Williams might play the second most minutes of the freshman, but I think KK could could push for number two. That's a good pick, Jalen Tate. I almost went with him. I'm going to go with Connor Van over though, for all the reasons that I listed beforehand that I don't think I necessarily need to go into again. But I think that that position is going to be held down. If my predictions are right, it would be held down by Justin Smith. Uh, the four to five spot. Uh, but, you know, Connor could work his way into the starting lineup without a doubt. I just think that for Connor's game, especially for this year, it might be best for him to come off the bench and get 15 minutes a game. Maybe push to 20, depending on how he plays. And then see, you know, if in those 15 to 20 minutes, if he can give you everything he's got and knock down four three pointers, then you're feeling pretty good about yourself. All right, now to the three awards. Those are the three common awards. Now the three awards that I made up for this Arkansas team, and it's kind of three awards that are Arkansas-specific and how they're going to replace three guys. So when I thought of these three guys last year, so these three awards are the Shooter, the Go-To, and Mr. Reliable. When I thought of these three awards last year, the Shooter, I have to say it kind of like Pat Bradley Mm -hmm. uh, in his Boston accent, I thought of Isaiah Joe. The go-to was Mason Jones, and Mr. Reliable was Jimmy Witt. Could have been a little bit of Mason Jones, too, because he was almost reliable to go for 30 almost every night. Yeah. (laughs) But the shooter this year, I'll start us off, Sky, since you've gone first and give you an opportunity to breathe over there. I don't think there's any doubt about it that it's got to be J.D. Notze. The the fact that the guy just came up in – you charted him, Scotty. How many shots, how many three-pointers did he take? I think he took 18. Eight, he was, 18? He was, two of, he was two of four in the left corner. One, two, three, four, five. He hit five left-wing threes, one in the center of the floor, and then one on the right wing. He's, he's going to heave it up, and he's going to make a decent clip of him as well. It's not a fair comparison to make a comparison to Isaiah Job. In fact, uh, Isaiah Job was a – generational type shooter and the fact of when he crossed the line he could put the ball in the bucket but i think we're going to see more of those guys as the not just the year progresses but as the years progress because shooting has become guys are growing up with the three-point line guys are growing up with the fact of that they are shooting trying to make threes when they are six seven years old so that the, by the time that they are in high school when they're 16 17 18 that's just natural and that they are extending their range and extending their range. I think that they're shooting in the three-point line. You've seen that in the NBA and even in college. Three is more than two, so we're going to take more threes to make more points. That's just the way it goes. And I think that that is going to continue to be a trend of where we're going to see really great shooters, not only at the University of Arkansas, but all around, which is another reason why three-point defense might be key. But uh, I think that J.D. Note, without a doubt, is your shooter. I'm going Moses Moody. Oh, his jumpers smooth as silk, and the I was really impressed with one of the threes that he hit. I think from the top of the key, he got it off in a flash. And in the SEC, when defenders are, you know, in your jersey trying to defend you, that's that's going to be invaluable. And I think Moses is Moses is going to shoot a, a really good clip from from three. He he shot almost 50 percent from three his senior year of high school like he's he's more than capable i know that he played really good competition but this is you know another step up maybe two steps up from that but i'm gonna go with with moses i think he's i think he's gonna have a pretty impressive year from three there's a guy i can't remember if it was 
KK, Kalen Robinson, or if it was Devontae Davis watching the red white game. I wrote it down, but I forgot my notes. Somebody can elevate when they shoot. Oh, it was probably KK. Okay. okay. I, th- I didn't want to say for a fact who it was, but I thought it may have been KK. Dude, especially he shot a baseline jumper that went that he made and I, I saw his feet come parallel to whoever was guarding him. They didn't get off the ground. Came out to his freaking waist, man. He elevates on his yeah. shots. And that's good because he can create his own shot in a place kind of like down low and on the baseline. Mm-hmm. That'll be interesting to watch. Now I'm not calling him my shooter by any stretch of imagination. All right, the go-to. My go-to is going to be Moses Moody. As I mentioned earlier in the podcast, Musselman even said they started running set plays for guys in end-of-game situations. And he said Moses was the guy that they kind of settled on, at least to start the season. You know, and these things can change because Mason Jones wasn't the guy to start the season last year, but he turned into the guy. Uh, But by the Georgia Tech game, as you can tell when he walk off banked in three, Moses Moody is going to start the season as the guy. And as you said, for all the reasons you said, Scotty, about his three point shooting ability and his ability to make plays. I think he's going to stay the guy and I think he's going to be your go-to when you need a bucket down the stretch. He's going to be the guy you get to. Now, he may not be the guy that facilitates the the play. I'm going to have uh, a talk about that in our Mr. Reliable portion coming up, but I think that he is going to be the guy that you're going to look to get the ball at the end of the game to take the shot. Yeah, I'm going to go. I'll give you two. I'm going with JD and Moses. And sleeper third option, if you want to use the two guys I just mentioned as a, as a decoy, Vance Jackson, if you need a perimeter shot, I think I think I think Vance could develop into into that guy. I was a little bit surprised that he didn't take or he didn't put up as many shots as he did in the red white game, but I understand it's it's just a inter squad scrimmage and JD took a lot of them. When from, you have a guy take eighteen, it's hard to get up other shots. For sure, yeah, I'll go with the. I think the go to guys entering the season are JD and Moses. I think those are. In, in my mind, I think those are the, the clear two options at this point. Good stuff. All right. Last but certainly not least is Mr. Reliable. And as you mentioned, Desi Sills might have been my Mr. Reliable earlier. He is. I think he's a guy that you can depend on. He's going to be steady Eddie, steady Desi all throughout the season. In the, I think that he is going to be a guy that this team will lean on in certain situations. Uh, games against you know maybe Mississippi Valley State and UCA – they're not going to need Desi. But on the road, up by two with two minutes to go, you feel comfortable with Desi hitting a corner three. You feel comfortable with Desi, the ball in his hands, driving to the hoop. Um, the toughness factor, the fact that he's been there before and really is one of the – you know, I know Ethan Henderson is on the team, and I don't want to downplay Ethan Henderson at all, but he's the one of the guys that has the most experience on this team with this coaching staff coming into the season, the guys is going to play a lot. So I think that Mr. Reliable goes to Desi Sills. There you go. You give him some love. It's much deserved. Um, I'm, my Mr. Reliable is going to be Justin Smith. He's just – he's steady. His demeanor never changes. And I think just having that even keel kind of personality is going to help him remain calm in like some really big situations. Like when you're on the road – and maybe you're you're up to you need a defensive stop and you need a defensive rebound to ice the game away. I think Justin Smith's going to give you some of that interior toughness that you need. Some big rebounds. I'm not going to. I think he's probably he could probably have this season a more impressive ten and five per game than he did at Indiana last year. I don't think you have to design a play for Justin Smith for him to score, and he's. Clearly, he's going to get out and transition and try to dunk it on your head whenever he can. So I think his points are going to come from transition. Um, you know, maybe maybe they play him in that dunker spot a little bit, kind of like kind of like they did with Jimmy Witt last year. Justin Smith's vertical obviously comes to mind. Why you want to? Why you might want him in that spot? And you know, I just keep coming back to you know, Arkansas is going to find itself in some close games probably on the road, probably some at home too. Like that Florida game we mentioned earlier, Justin Smith could come up. He could prove to be really big in those games, just coming up with some big rebounds and some tough buckets on the interior. Um, 
and he could, I mean, he could be, he could be the difference in some of those, you know, season altering type games where, you know, he goes up and grabs a rebound and secures a win that, you know, puts Arkansas at a, at a spot entering the SEC tournament that gives them a, you know, a pretty good outlook for the, for the rest of the postseason. You think that you're a little excited for Wednesday, Scotty? Uh, we just did an hour pregame show on a team that hasn't even played a real game yet. I'm ready, man. Oh, man, we're so excited. Mississippi Valley State coming up on Wednesday. Make sure to tune in there and make sure to tune in to the basketball podcast of Mid-America because this is just the first of the season, but it definitely will not be the last. Scotty and I will be here all season long to talk some Arkansas basketball. All right, Scotty, did I miss anything? I don't think so. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that Arkansas beats Mississippi Valley State to get the season started. Good, good. That's that's a, that is a very out on the limb pick. Hey, let's we'll, go even we'll one We'll see how it there. goes. What about Saturday's game against North Texas? Well, that game will probably. I like Arkansas's play. odds in that one too. All right, all right, good, good. good. Scotty, stepping out. I will say, if you look at the schedule on the Arkansas Razorbacks website, the Mississippi Valley State uh, mascot he looks pretty intimidating. I'm not gonna lie. I think they're the demons. Something like that. Didn't Jerry Rice play there? Played football there. Yes. I think the bas- the baseball team played Arkansas, and I think Arkansas beat them 24, 32 to nothing. Oh gosh. Yeah, it was it was brutal. All right. Well, for Scotty Borderline and our entire wholehogsports.com crew, I am Seth Campbell saying thank you for joining us. We know there are a ton of podcasts out there, uh, so we really t- appreciate you taking the time to listen to ours. If you like our podcast. You can share it with a friend. That's one of the best ways for us to grow and for your friends to be more informed about the Arkansas Razorbacks because as you can tell here on the whole, on the basketball podcast in America, we like talking hoops. Well, for Scotty Borderline, I am Seth Gamble saying so long. We will see you back here next week.